Welcome to Harbinger's flagship interactive webinar, Power Hour. Select the right speaker for audio output. Test your speaker from audio settings. If necessary, join the webinar using your phone. Use the queue and a panel to share your questions. This webinar is being recorded. Attendees will receive the recording. Let's tune in. Hello everyone, greetings from Harbinger. My name is Anuj and I'm the moderator for today's exciting event. First and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out to join us for today's interactive learning power hour session hosted by Harbinger. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, please allow me to provide some context. So Power Hour is a series of interactive roundtable discussions, which is hosted by Harbinger, where industry experts share their experiences and insights on various topics. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is elevate e-learning content and unblock its true pot potential with Gen AI. Um, we also have an exciting announcement for all the participants. Stick around till the end of today's Power Hour for, for a special giveaway for all our attendees. So don't miss out uh, on this giveaway or giveaway for you that we have at the end. Um, and with that, it, it is time to introduce our host for today's Power Hour session. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Vikas Joshi. Dr. Vikas Joshi is a business leader who is passionate about product development and technology entrepreneurship. His mission is to help create software products that make a difference. Uh, and a key part of that mission is to inspire tech professionals and entrepreneurs to grow and develop. Uh, as a founder and CEO of Harbinger Group, uh, Vikas drives Harbinger's vision with a relentless focus on innovation. Uh, his doctoral research at the University of Pennsylvania was on entrepreneurial learning. Uh, he's an alumni of Harvard Business School. Uh, we welcome you, Vikas, and uh, you know I hand over the stage to you. Hey, uh, thank you, Anuj. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, folks, we have uh, a very exciting power hour today with uh, three eminent experts in AI and its application to learning. Uh, but before I bring them in, I just wanted to set a context. So here's the game plan for today. We're going to learn in today's power hour how to reduce content aging, you know, keeping it current, um, continuously repurposing and upgrading content using generative AI more efficiently, more effectively. Also, we're going to talk about interesting, cost-effective, and rapid solutions to modernize learning. And finally, we're going to hear about some real-world examples um, that talk about the success stories of Gen AI um, transforming learning content. So sounds like a plan? Okay, then let's start with context setting. So if you think about AI in everyday life, I'm sure this screen looks familiar to all of you, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, you have, you encounter AI without even realizing that it's at play. For example, Netflix uses, you're watching history uh, and compares it with users that have similar tastes to recommend which shows to watch next, right? But look closely at this screen. What you'll see is all these are thumbnails of the same show, Stranger Things. Did you know that Netflix uses AI to pick a thumbnail customized to your tastes? They use thousands of video frames from a movie or a show as a starting point for thumbnail generation. And then they annotate these images and rank them to try and identify which one you are most likely to click. The calculations could be based on the actor that you like, or what others with a, with tastes that are similar to you have clicked on. And it's amazing how much traction that generates. Now, similarly, think about this. What if learning could use 
this technique? What if a learning experience platform would create evolving learning paths based on personalization just for you by looking at your learning goals, your preferences, your course selection history, and your progress? This is just one of the many things AI could do in the field of learning and professional development. Now, just how rapidly is AI spreading in the world of design? Let's find out. We do have a slide here that shows that more than 15 billion images were created using text to image algorithms in 2023 alone. To put this in perspective, it took photographers 150 years from the first photograph taken in 1826 until 1975 to reach the 15 billion mark. So right from stable diffusion, which is a free to use deep learning text to image model by OpenAI, through DALI 2 that you must have heard of, Adobe Firefly that's making waves for the last three months and mid-journey, you have a variety of tools to create images from text. So this is really taking off. Our next question is how do HR and L&D professionals perceive the role of AI in their work? So let's look at a couple of surveys here. The HR Exchange Network conducted a survey of HR talent and L&D professionals across the globe in 2023. And here's what they found. Recruiting and onboarding took the top two spots for AI application, but learning and development was the third most impacted area by Gen AI. Also, 70% of the attendees at Corporate Learning 2023 said that they approved of the use of generative AI in learning content development. Here's another survey. Cypher Learning conducted a study of 400 HR professionals, and these are business leaders across US and UK. And what they found is three key themes driving AI adoption in L&D. First, improve learning experiences through more engaging and enjoyable uh, content. Two, developing assessments. Uh, that evaluate learner, learner progress and doing this automatically, obviously. And thirdly, saving time in course development. As you know, there is learning content that comes in all sizes and shapes. There are some courses that you hope live for 10 years, and there are some that are literally needed today, and they'll probably be relevant just for a couple of months because you're rolling out a change initiative or a new policy change, and within a couple of months, its role will be over. So clearly, you want to be able to create such content rapidly and deploy it rapidly. And that's where they're perceiving the role because it saves time. So now's the time to come to you and ask you that question. Have you started using generative AI tools for e-learning course development, whether it is ChatGPT, or DALI or Midjourney or any of the other tools we talked about. Um, what's your choice? Here's a poll that Anuj has launched and uh, you can simply select the option that closely matches your situation. I can see a lot of responses are coming here. Okay, yep. so shall we show the results? Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, the results are up on the screen. Okay. So it looks like uh, close to 48% of our attendees have already started using it and uh, another chunk are uh, starting to explore it. So. Um, the game is already on. 
I want to show you one more example, um, but before I do that, uh, may I ask you to share the names of the tools you are using in the chat window? It'd be a good thing to learn from each other what AI tools this community is using or considering using or have heard of. It'd be good to see that in your chat window. All right. And while you do that, here's my last slide before we bring in the panel. And this is an example of AI translation for videos. What I'm gonna show you is a video that is translated in the same voice and by adjusting lip movements. It's amazing, folks. Take a look. Imagine if you could speak eight languages fluently and connect with billions more people around the world. Well, now you can do it with AI. Let me show you how. Imagine speaking eight languages fluently and connecting with billions more people worldwide. Now, AI can make it possible. Let me demonstrate. Imagina hablar ocho idiomas y conectar con miles de millones de personas en todo el mundo. Ahora puedes hacerlo con IA. Déjame mostrarte cómo. सोचिए अगर आप आठ भाषाओं में बात कर सकते हो और दुनिया भर के अधिकांश लोगों से जुड़ सकते हो अब आप इसे एआई के साथ कर सकते हैं मुझे दिखाने दो कैसे करें After working in HR and sales management positions for IT companies, he served as an officer in the US Marine Corps after graduating with a business degree from the University of Oklahoma. Following his service in USMC, he worked in HR and sales management in the IT field before founding Evolve, his last position as VP of sales for an internet-based company in occupational safety first introduced him to internet-based training and spurred his desire to create his own company. So now he has his own company, his background in the healthcare IT and experience working in business with recurring revenue models led to the company's focus on compliance training for healthcare industry. Preston lives in Alexandria, Virginia, and that's where he's, uh, he's joining us from along the Potomac River. He's the father of three sons, who also served in USMC and USN and has been married to his college sweetheart, Keely Steiner, for 42 years. Welcome, Preston, and tell us what makes you interested in this topic. Um, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Well, sir, first, I want to say thank you for asking me to participate today in this webinar. I am uh, the founder and CEO of Evolve Learning Solutions, and we provide OSHA safety training primarily to the healthcare industry. Our our courses include topics like bloodborne pathogens, infection control, fire safety, radiation safety, and more. Uh, and we created the courses to target specifically to the healthcare industry by utilizing scenarios, images, topics that fit those specific requirements for that industry. Uh, we basically went through all the OSHA regulations as it relates to healthcare and created a course to meet those. Uh, we have HIPAA training courses uh, that cover uh, for both covered entities, providers, and as well their business associates. We also have training courses that for healthcare that cover fraud and abuse uh, in that area. And then kind of cross-industry courses, we've developed what we call human resource courses, like right? driver safety, uh, active shooter response, ethics, security awareness, and then specific EEO courses for sexual harassment prevention and anti-discrimination and bullying. Uh, we utilize Articulate 360 uh, for uh, our course development, which has made it very easy to partner with a Harbinger in our, our current project. Um, and we sell our courses both from an online, our online store as well through uh, direct, uh, our direct sales force. Uh, we do deliver our training through our LMS, and we can also deliver our training courses through, to the customer's LMS with a, another vendor that we work with. For me personally, I, I enjoy using new technologies, which first brought, drew me to the online training uh, back in about 2001. I, I like the way technology, the 
particularly the internet, as it was just coming into fruition back at that time, uh, provides the tools and capabilities that change the way people and, and businesses work. Uh, and then kind of after stumbling across the first AI company I engaged with to create just the audio for courses, uh, I decided to use the same type of technology when I made the decision to add video to our courses in our, our current course modernization project. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you and welcome again. Uh, and, and we'll talk more as we go. Uh, we also have today with us you, Rambo. Um, welcome you back to Harbinger Power Hour a second time. You stands at the forefront of transformative digital learning, uh, bringing over 19 years of dedicated experience in this field. He recently clinched a prestigious Brandon Hall Award for his outstanding contributions in online learning strategy, implementation, and measurement. His visionary leadership has resulted in the creation of a robust online ecosystem for training programs, catalyzing a profound cultural shift toward a learning first organization. Um, I have heard you speak before and it's gonna be a treat uh, listening to him again. Um, he has served on classroom virtual e-learning and instructional design teams at several Fortune 100 companies. He possesses a holistic understanding of learning processes. Welcome you and uh, uh, tell us a bit about what got you interested in this topic. Hey, thanks for having me back, Dr. Vikas and Harbinger Group. I appreciate being able to take this opportunity to speak to you and everyone today. Um, I'm definitely a learning technologist. I think that that's, you know, been prevalent in everything that I've shared with, with audiences in the past. And I have really dug into uh, generative AI and some of the uh, opportunities that are available over the past year, year and a half almost. Um, as I sit on the Digital Learning Institute Advisory Council, I just finished up taking and completing my uh, generative AI for L&D certification. And I'm finishing up a, a certification right now with IBM for Gen AI. Um, I wanted to know really the root of how this whole artificial intelligence, you know, the behind the scenes, the black box, how it works. So I'm very uh, interested in, in just not talking from an academia perspective today of theories, but actually the true applications of this technology, where I think we are today and where I think we'll go in the future. And uh, as you know, there's a couple of uh, roadmaps that I've created in the past. So I'll, I'll share what I can today. So I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Thanks again. And uh, now we have Umesh, um, who is our third panelist. Uh, Umesh has more than two decades of experience at Harbinger in leading software development, AI, and cloud engineering. Uh, he's very much a techie. He's done a bunch of technology research and he drives the strategic initiatives in building a competitive advantage through Harbinger Center of Excellence, where we strengthen our intellectual property portfolio. He also leads the capability development function at Harbinger to drive skill development, particularly technology skills and uh, talent readiness. He's involved in solutions consulting for future of work and hyper automation initiatives at Harbinger. Welcome, Amish. A few words from you, maybe. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this conversation. Uh, I think what excites me most is the technology and the Gen AI is so disruptive uh, in the space of uh, content development. Uh, I mean, the, the amount of automation opportunities is like, like quadrupled, right, in uh, these mm -hmm. uh, recent times. And uh, what excites is the whole speed at which it is enabling that content generation, you know, multiple types of ideas and over entire content development process in general. And uh, with the whole, uh, the, the personalized touch to it, you can sort of, uh, you know, cater to the audience segments and even individual preferences can be addressed at all these things that at scale, uh, where as AI learns those things, uh, as it gets mature, you can get improved quality, you get different variety. Uh, and there are so many different creative ways in which now it has been enabling uh, the, the same content to be, you know, presented in different ways and different styles and formats and so on, right? Uh, and all this is with very little investment as such. So uh, I'm hearing from the publishers also like how they are trying to go broad with broader with global reach and 
with the translations and localizations all enabled through the Gen AI. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the whole cost saving and other sort of aspects which are all these automations are bringing in, uh, that's essentially showing that whole, how the technology is really uh, you know, impact here. And uh, I think, and it's really maturing so fast. So, I mean, that's, that's whole excitement is really bringing me uh, for such conversations as well. Perfect, Ramesh. Thank you for joining again. And, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to turn to Preston with our first question, which is, um, <clears throat> what was your thought process uh, that kind of underpins your, um, um, modernization of content using generative AI. What were some of the some of the goals and considerations, and uh, potentially some of the challenges that you uh, thought of as you embarked sure. on this path? For sure. If you let me, I guess, take a step back and kind of tell you our process and where we got to this point using generative AI. Sure. Our initial courses developed well before AI became available. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, for example, we initially contract with voiceover professionals uh, in studios to record audio narration, which I think is pretty important to have in, in courses. Uh, the results were good, but the costs were, were pretty high as well. Then we use, began to use uh, contractors who did the recording from their own, their own recording and their own production, but we found that while the costs were reduced, the, the results became a bit in, inconsistent depending upon the contractor and even the equipment and environment they recorded in. Uh, for us, it's important to, to update our courses, uh, even if say regulatory requirements don't change, just to give learners a new, somewhat of a new experience. So we, we do update our courses. And the, I guess the negative part of using contractors in to do audio is that the inconsistency of the original recording to the recordings that, we, that they did for updates. Well, we finally then brought the recording in house, trying to get some more consistency uh, and bring our costs down even more. And we were successful in that, but um, in getting the consistency, but maybe not the, the overall quality initially. And as over time, then we began to uh, increase the, the quality of the equipment in the environment that we use to record our, our audio in. Um, and then, uh, and so that worked well. But about three years ago, we began to develop a new course, I think it was a request from a particular customer. And I began to search for just new equipment to use in-house. And uh, during my search, I happened to stumble upon a company called Wellsaid Labs that uh, advertised AI using voice avatars for the audio record recording. And at the time, I was, really wasn't even aware that AI technology existed other than you know, computer-generated sound or voices, which you know, I wasn't going to use in our courses. Uh, so I set up a test account. Um, and after doing some test accounts with uh, well said labs, I began to search for some com for competitors to get some comparisons to see uh, what their voice quality was about, the pricing, ease of use. And then I ultimately selected uh, uh, well, -said La well said labs. Um, one of the things I did uh, with that, I wanted to make sure that not only was the quality initially good, but then it was going to be consistent when we did do updates to the courses. Uh, and one of the neat things I thought about them as well, uh, is that they even pay residuals to their voice actors uh, whose voices are used uh, by customers recording audio. So I kind of stumbled into that, but uh, mainly for the, uh, I guess, for the reasons that I just mentioned, uh, that I wanted to find ways in which I could kind of streamline the efficiencies of the recording, reduce cost, uh, and, uh, and even in the time uh, to get it done. Oh, um, Preston, I'm going to, you know, sort of, interrupt you for a second, but a uh, yep. uh, question for the audience. Uh, if you can use your chat and let me know if you can hear Preston fine. At least one participation, one participant cannot hear. So, okay. So most of you can. Okay. Mm. Um, I might suggest, you know, you may have to change over your speaker or something. I do not know. Oh, really? um, okay. For that one person, but the rest of you are doing fine. So I guess uh, we'll just carry on here. Um, so with that, uh, Preston, that's kind of the background and it brought you to where you are in terms of your content uh, modernization journey. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but if you want to add anything, please go ahead and then we'll come back to you again. Okay. Well, I guess the next step in the evolution was selecting uh, when we began to do the video. 
creation. Yeah. And uh, so I knew about obviously AI for the voice, but not the uh, not the video yet. And I just knew that we needed to incorporate that into our courses, looking at some of the competitors. But then I began to look at some of the business factors uh, we were working with and elected to uh, to go with the, uh, the route of gen generative AI uh, for our video production as well for the courses. OK, cool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to you now. And uh, um, you has developed uh, a speed to competency framework, um, which is a generative AI framework. So this is this is a competency framework, uh, competency based learning framework that incorporates uh, AI ideas. And uh, I was quite intrigued by it. And I thought we should take a look at that today. So uh, Hugh, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, uh, thank you. So the idea of speed of competency is that as you onboard new employees, whether it's um, to a new job, a new skill, a new role, a new company, um, how do we move them through their path to knowledge, skill transfer, and application in, in a faster way? And um, I think one of the big things that generative AI as a framework allows us to do is to much like Omesh was talking about, the ability of connectivity. Oh, there it is. That's perfect. This at least gives us somewhat of a visual, right? So in at the bottom of this screen, you have your, you know, your target audience, your globally distributed player, if you will, and, and the learner is going to interact with that, that player. Um, then you have a mechanism that's delivering it, whether it's you know LMS, LXP, et cetera. And we have the ability to integrate these. So we can we can integrate in, you know, I use ChatGPT as an example here um, through an API paid key solution. And we can feed uh, generative AI some, some information as we go through this. And you'll notice that there is a client or process information that's loaded up and there's a quality table that would be used for, for assessing the responses. And some of these things are happening screen over screen or some of them are happening in real time. But the idea is um, if you were sitting in a classroom of 30 people in a physical location, none of you would receive the same question twice. So you actually have to think as a human being on your own. The second part is that, you know, you're going to have to respond to a question that may be on the same topic, but worded different each time. So again, you're going to have to readjust your focus and your thought process. And then we can score that along a quality table for attributes and, and outcomes that we think are important in your response. And then using, um, you know, like an LRS system, we can actually follow the quality score in the response. Um, we can turn that all into a dashboard and we can see the health score. Um, so the idea of this is to move you, you know, if you're in a 90 day process for upskilling and onboarding, that we're able to reduce the time to speed to competency through this process. And it might only be 15 minutes a day that you're interacting with this um, course player, if you will. And there's what I love about this is there's no finish line. Like this could just continue on throughout your entire career if you wanted it to, depending on what what aspects you're trying to learn. And I know that I shared this at, at like the 1.0 level, and I, I've actually refined this a little bit. I have some new thoughts and some differentiators in this process, but this at least gives you a, a, a visual roadmap of what could be done um, and not just theory-based, but actually full application. Um, and, you know, this is just one of the things that I think are, is really important when we're talking about AI, because, you know, today I, I joke that we're in like the MySpace of prompting chat GPT, right? We're, we're, we're still back, you know, we haven't moved into the future. And, and I, I do have some new ideas with this specific framework of, you know, being able to move from a one-to-one -to, -one to a one versus many, um, you know, can we get to an automated and an autonomous uh, situation with this? And instead of having single trans transactions, can we get to like a two-way transaction? So in other words, continued input as the session builds based on the output of what ChatGPT or another AI is giving you and, and deepening your learning of the competency and assessment. Um, so one of the hardest things for this process is the speed of it. You know, so humans, we simply cannot keep up with how fast this moves, right? As, as we prompt and we, we, as we share information with generative AI, man, I don't know about you, I, I really can't keep up with how fast it can move. And so, you know, as we think about whether it's speed to knowledge, speed to skill, or speed to application, um, we're gonna have to figure out ways to um, slow things down for our learners so that they aren't overwhelmed. Um, 
but yeah, this is really a, a, a free framework for anyone who's listening that wants to incorporate these things. There's many different technologies that are implemented along here. You're mm -hmm. going to need a little bit of programming language to go with it, but luckily generative AI will, will do that for you if you're able to prompt it in the right format. So, I mean, from, from soup mm -hmm. to nuts, this, you, you literally could use ChatGPT to build the whole thing. Um, we integrated this into Storyline 360, much like Preston had, had talked about where, you know, in a previous articulate shop. And, um, you know, I was thinking about your previous question um, with updating information. And I recently sat through um, IMC Express, um, mm -hmm. their, their artificial intelligence tool where they're able to take a PowerPoint or documentation Wow, that is, it's an incredible technology that they've figured out a way to harness this and produce almost a articulate rise uh, format output. It's just really impressive. Um, and that's a static, that example, IMC Express would be a static use of that technology. For me, what's been turning my wheels lately is getting into a two-way two situation with the learner. How do we get a continuous ecosystem of the learner interacting with AI behind the scenes that we still have some control over, right? We want to make sure that we maintain control about what responses we're receiving, what responses we're giving. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. There's always this endless debate about uh, the degree of control, right? <clears throat> Whether the teacher has control or the learner has control and, and to what extent it, it is divided between the two. I think the AI sort of brings that debate alive all over again, uh, because the learner wants to go in a certain direction. Uh, the curriculum suggests that he or she go in another direction. And now we have the AI as the mediating um, platform that, that gives more fine-grained information about uh, what the learner's misconceptions might be, or what kind of interventions might be needed in essentially evolving the learning path in a two-way interaction. So be very curious to see where this goes and uh, best for this. Uh, the other thing that we need to keep uh, looking at is, you know, the business concerns, right? I mean, we hear a bunch of business concerns around generative AI, for example, copyright, legal data security, customer data privacy, bias, hallucination, and more. How did you guys go about handling the business concerns, talking to your stakeholders, not just the learners, but you know, you know, the business leaders, and getting everyone on the same page uh, in, in sort of blessing the implementation of some of these ambitious ideas? Uh, maybe one of you can get us started and you know, go from there. <clears throat> Sure. Um, I, I'd be happy to kick off at least. And um, sure. I know that depending on what we're doing, what we're, we're, I, I think of this from a research perspective, right? So consensus um, is a, uh, if, you're, if you're following what's going on with ChatGPT and GPTs themselves, right? So now ChatGPT has brought forward this marketplace that has customized GPTs and consensus is one of those modules where you can go out, do some research, and then you can actually um, give credit where credit's due. You can know that you have certain knowledge, you know, that's been documented and it's, uh, you know, I don't want to say APA format, but it gives you an idea of where these ideas have come from mm -hmm. and you're able to, to give credit. And that's, it's very important, right? Um, especially as we start sharing intellectual knowledge or protected IP. Can't stress that. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's been interesting for me is the hallucinations part. Um, I have seen some really interesting research and, and uh, items that have been done on, you know, the bias and the hallucinations. And I think that my advice to the audience would be, um, if you're headed down the path, do a ton of research on those two topics because they will help you understand when you see it, how you see it and what you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So being directly educated in you know, what the outputs are, and then you're going to change your prompting. You're definitely going to change how you let a learner interact with a system. Like, I'm again, I'm thinking from that system's perspective. You want to be really specific. You want to put the guardrails in place. That all needs to be part of what you're passing to generative AI to say, hey, you know, these are the boundaries. Um, and 
keep your participants within those guardrails. You know, if the participant responds with something that's, you know, aud audaciously crazy uh, in a response, generative AI should be able to identify that and understand and redirect that learner, much like you were speaking to earlier. How do we keep them on the course? You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm still thinking about this from, you know, the game of Monopoly is a good example, right? You, you roll the dice and you move so many spaces. We have to make sure that we understand how many, you know, rolls a person gets, what numbers can come up on the dice, how many spaces they can move, where they can land, what are the impacts of landing on that space. We're really still moving, and and I would almost say like Candyland um, as a game, like it's it's a child's game, right? It's a very early child's game, so maybe not even as advanced as Monopoly, but we really have to be uh, smart about what we're allowing in and out of our systems. Um, Preston, with experience in you know the Marine Corps, I think about DMZs, right? Like you know, so like where where do we cut off, right? Where does that where do we make sure there's a line drawn that we're able to separate what's happening on a user's screen with what the input and outputs are? True. Absolutely. I mean, rules is what makes games um, really. And uh, here again, I think the setting the boundaries would be critical. Um, the question though is how, and uh, some of it may be down to the way you uh, you know, just issue guidelines or something, and some of it may be within the technology. Uh, we'll talk more about it, but uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Preston come in on this point. Sure. I just received a, a chat, hello, from uh, the person who was a principal subject matter expert and course developer for many of our courses that we have. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that, that she joined us. Hi, Nate. <laughs> I guess my... Uh, the guardrails that you had mentioned, or uh, I guess getting the buy-in from other stakeholders. Fortunately, mm -hmm. as the, the person who who has a hundred percent stake in, in my company, I didn't have to get approval from uh, from any other people to uh, to get our project going, uh, which made it a heck of a lot easier, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, and as well, then we were, were working within the framework of the content that had been developed previously as we, we engaged with Harbinger uh, in our course modernization project. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that uh, that I had looked at and the factors that I did look at were, were some of the business aspects of, of things using the technology in the course modernization project. Um, one of the things, the benefits that I saw and, and why I chose to do that as opposed to, say, recording videos within the traditional process by the studio with a paid actor or actress uh, were cost considerations. Uh, we have about 55 courses that... Uh, we need to get changed. We need to get updated, and and the cost was going to be, you know, fairly significant uh, if we had gone the traditional studio route. Um, so I, I certainly uh, I took that into uh, into consideration, and uh, by being able to incorporate video into into our courses, we're able to have them at a par, equal to or, or surpassing some of our larger competitors. Um, Limitations, I guess, in the way in which we use it and the way the, the vendors that we have or some of the interactivity between avatars. Right now, there are avatars that, that speak uh, to us, or to, the, to the learner, but we don't aren't able yet to have two on the same slide where they can engage themselves in kind of an interactive scenario between two characters on the slide, the same slide. We're hoping you know, that our, our vendors get uh, to that at some important time. So, so cost obviously was, was one. Um, and one of the, the uh, another time was obviously was, was the access to the tools. Uh, you know, Harbinger developers, their team is, is located in a different part of the world than what we are. And uh, using AI and the, the platforms we utilize, it, it allows them to use those tools uh, for us uh, remotely, which takes a, a heck of a lot of the burden from us in a practical application of, of the course development. Uh, Another business perspective that I that I took into consideration as I selected the, the vendors that we we're working with was their financial backing. Backing, uh, it is a new technology. There are a lot of companies. I say a lot, but there are a number of smaller companies that are in the marketplace now. And as I mentioned previously, even discussing the audio, uh, I wanted to make sure that I found and partnered with the company that could not only create the videos that we need today, but would be around a year or two uh, from now as well when we might need to update the videos within the slide, or as we want to incorporate newer technologies that might introduce into our, into our training courses. So having a, a partner 
uh, that had the financial resources was very important to, to me as I, I did my, uh, my due diligence. Um, I mean, we ultimately picked a company called Synthesia, and uh, I think that, uh, that it's been working uh, quite well uh, for them. So I guess for me, it was financial backing, uh, cost considerations for us. Uh, timing was another thing. It was very important to being able to, um, to get this done, uh, record the videos with literally just a script, not having mm -hmm. to have all the logistic, logistical considerations of, uh, you know, coordinating with studios and recording, coordinating with actors and all that. So the timing was, was a very important thing. So from that perspective, uh, we've now developed uh, – uh, just under 30 courses completely changed and modernized and now they're, they're out on the market in a project that started, I guess, the first development uh, began in September of 2023. So just in a few short months, we were able to take and completely modernize and change all of our, of our training courses in just a, about a four or five month period. So that's been, from a business perspective, uh, a very important part of uh, incorporating uh, regenerative AI into, into our course development projects. And the, the speed of conversion is impressive. I mean, it's in a matter of months you have turned your catalog into a, a, a complete makeover, right? Pretty much. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, any follow up from you, uh, you? Yeah, I was I was thinking about the the larger picture as as, as we were talking, and you asked a poignant question. I think I think the onus is going to fall to companies. And Preston, you definitely are. That, that is awesome that you have the opportunity to lead that. And I think that leadership, you know, HR, IT, um, compliance, the company needs to create policy around the use of Gen AI. And, and we're starting to see this occur. However, you know, over time, I, I worry that new precedents in law, right? We're still at the beginning of this. The future is very foggy and unclear, but what we absolutely from a corporation or company standpoint, I, I definitely think that policy would need to be written. There needs to be a set of rules and guidelines in place. And I think that of the organization, there are a lot of key players within it that would have to sit down and make uh, concessions and agreements around what can we do with this. Thank you. So we now uh, turn to, uh, to Umesh for a little bit of the under the hood discussion. Uh, what are what are some of the new solutions that are uh, uh, being designed at Harbinger for generative AI content development? Uh, can you take us through some of that, please, Amish? Sure, uh, I think what we heard so far, all these Gen AI capabilities in the space of content development. I think what we are trying to do is how it can be done at scale in a much more automated fashion for the entire movie, uh, the way IDs would think about that whole process of end-to-end -end development of the content. And right from, uh, you know, the, the styles and the interactions and the delivery of engagement, uh, maybe the assessment, reinforcement aspect, and overall, like how to take it to the sort of a global audience and so on. So we thought of addressing that, uh, like every stage of this uh, content development, uh, how uh, IDs would look at it, uh, and not just aspect of end to end, but you know they can pick up at every any stage, you know, to leverage the Gen AI to its full potential. Uh, so maybe uh, if we could uh, pick this, yeah. So so these are the sort of all stages that we are seeing a you know great opportunity to leverage the Gen AI. And uh, right from starting with the outlinings, uh, where which include like identifying key points, uh, the learning objectives, or how you structure that full content in modules, uh, or giving it more like a logical flow to that. Uh, so all these aspects, JNI is really able to uh, you know construct it to a specific audience, and it can do it more at different educational levels of, for that topic. Uh, giving real good solid foundation for that full course development. And now taking that to the next level where you make it more engaging and very effective storyboards, uh, the module, I mean, it's more based on variety of nested prompt templates that help you uh, elaborate those each points into like detailed sections with maybe explanations, examples, uh, questions, uh, you know, all these, you know, help uh, sort of more uh, engaging aspect of it. And so this converts that whole content uh, 
uh, uh, assets into a storyboard structure uh, with visual cues or maybe layouts or scripts for the voiceovers. Uh, so uh, all these, you know, the JNI enables you to construct in a more storytelling format as well. And now uh, giving these storyboards uh, more visual treatment is now what we heard all these tools and services uh, uh, which are like very creative in nature as well, right? So it's not just about layout of the content or it's more like visuals, styles, and uh, even the interactive elements that we identify at every stage or every slides uh, to enhance this experience. And all these newer models and services are now uh, helping you give like even the images in the form of infographics, maybe even the charts or illustrations uh, for that matter. And uh, the text to image, text to video models, uh, the like multimodal, what we call it, have evolved to produce more like a photorealistic styles as well in terms of producing these images. And the this specific module actually integrates with those services over APIs so that you are in a position to leverage those dynamically, have multiple options while you are constructing your storyboards and, uh, you know, get you, uh, you know, variety of these uh, capabilities right embedded into your process itself. So be it uh, DALI or mid-journey kind of services or maybe uh, like in videos, which stitches multiple of those videos together in your custom content. So uh, even the, there is a lead, recent one, Google Lumiere is released now. So it's continuously evolving and you will get multiple options over the period as well. And uh, so the good part is it, you can plug and play with multiple similar services uh, to you know, make less fit. And all this you can construct and you know assemble into a course in a standard compliant SCOM ready. Uh, so we have a, our HTML framework that gives like 80 plus templates, um, you know, and, or you can even publish it into your uh, storyline articulator by putting into those authoring tools as well. Uh, now having the, the code part is sort of developed. Uh, I think the hardest part is building assessment on top of it. So what we just now saw in the stats as well, the assessment is quite crucial. And if uh, and the Gen AI has real capabilities of you know coming up with those uh, variety of questions. Our Quillian's product APIs itself are now Gen AI capable uh, to you know produce um, you know multiple choice or scenario based or maybe even just simple answers or even like interpretive questions at various difficulty levels also. Uh, now taking this content to the next level is the translation where we saw the you know uh, like a, a biggest disruption in terms of how uh, the significant way we have seen the improvement in the quality of translations uh, because uh, the ai understand the whole context of the topic as well as you know it can be trained for your specific domain and uh, uh, all specific terminologies as well so the translation quality is really superior compared to the traditional uh, machine translations, as we call it. So the, the tool uh, sort of helps support different formats, like you can export it from your storyline rise, which are in the form of XLIF files, uh, or you can have you know docx, pbtx, pdfs, kind of other file formats as well. But what essentially it also does is it retains the styles, layouts, and navigations, and all these aspects of your original formats. Uh, as it, it produces the translations as well. And uh, in the finally, the uh, the nudging aspect where, I mean, the whole, I would say return on investment of building all these learning resources is the learner should retain that knowledge over the period and should be able to apply it when it really uh, is needed. Uh, and that's where the reinforcement comes in picture. Uh, so the Gen AI helps you create these nudges, which may be in the form of micro learnings, maybe short summaries, maybe some quizzes and questions that can help you recall that information. Uh, those can be created using Gen AI uh, very quickly and uh, it can be delivered in a you know, standard fashion, like maybe the space learning, the, the way our sprinkle zone tools uh, enables it. So uh, in a nutshell, I think uh, now I think we probably are more trying to exploit the whole Gen AI capability at you know, every stage of the whole uh, content development and uh, each of these modules emphasizes the whole benefit of how uh, how efficiently you can do it, how you can personalize things, and you know do it all at scales. What all these things I think what JNA is bringing to the table. Yeah, thank you. This is quite fascinating, Omesh, uh, because you know 
right from producing outlines and storyboards, adding illustrations and pictures and videos, uh, automatically generating assessment questions, producing translations that retain layouts and formats, and ultimately repurposing the content into shorter courses or nudges that are delivered. All of this is possible with the generative AI framework directly or through APIs. And that's uh, that's right. wonderful. There's a question from a participant, Angela, um, uh, about a video, um, uh, any AI video tool that, uh, that you would recommend. Uh, you did mention one for stitching videos together. Which one was that? That's in video. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are multiple similar ones uh, and we can probably share some of the list as well. Okay. Yeah, it'd be good if we can, uh, you know, include that in our post uh, webinar. Absolutely. Okay. So um, moving on, I think our next uh, question for you is the challenges in designing uh, new solutions. And again, a quick time check, but we do have uh, only eight minutes. So we'll need to be a bit quick here. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the real challenge is adoption of such new technology, which is so disruptive. And uh, it, it starts from the, the whole process adaptation as well. Uh, like if you, the whole storyboard creation process may require complete rethinking and restructuring of the existing workflows as well. For example, the IDs can start the whole process without having a dependency on SMEs now because they can directly get a content brief generated on those topics and you know get themselves rolled out and sometimes the process also may require some human interventions and the reviews uh, so there is a good balance required now to how the automated AI outputs and how the human creativity should be used so we get the right quality uh, the other aspect definitely the data privacy aspect which is uh, you know we have like the content may have sensitive information, so you don't want it to go to the third party now to get some of these AI features. So, you know, what can be done in terms of making it secure? So one way is to definitely uh, all the firewalls and other aspects which will protect the environment, but from the AI point of view, ensure that you can do it on a uh, privately deployed on-prem uh, large language models that can be fine-tuned on your data. And uh, of course, it, it also limits it in terms of your options for using these services. And there could be a high investment in terms of uh, cost and efforts as well. Uh, the other key aspect here is uh, what I, we saw in the part of challenge in terms of how do you really resonate your, to your brand style and you know, identity. Uh, and uh, the we don't want the outcome to really sound like it's AI generated. It needs to really reflect you know, how your language and your tones are when you are constructing. And it should understand what your domain terminologies or tech terminologies or brand considerations as well. So it just helps you avoid any nuances that are caused by these generic pretend data sets. And it helps you reduce uh, uh, whatever significant adjustment that you may require every time. Okay. Uh, I think one quick thing is the prompt skill that because that really tells you how much your team is really equipped to make changes to the what tools and technologies are providing. And definitely there is a learning curve. I do find it difficult to adapt to such skills, uh, which are like very structured instructions to the AI models. Uh, the tools, uh, you know, can the, the way we have done it is like power users can, you know, edit those prompts and, you know, make the output work for them but not everybody is really up to that. So it's requ definitely require a good amount of training. Uh, I think the, the change management is the hardest part, I would say, because uh, you know every stakeholder needs to accept you know, the change in the role as well. Uh, you know, there is a resistance to this uh, in terms of the technology may uh, make me redundant or like there's a discomfort in general. And, uh, I think you need to make them make the team believe that you know it's really going to benefit themselves and uh, a mindset change is typically required where let's say SME need to think about only reviewing things and not to really get involved in every step of creations uh, or uh, I mean we have seen that uh, some of the customers talking about four months and all 
to they really accept this within the team uh our they are seeing that there is a whole lot of expectations of quick turn around uh, as the technology is enabling that so so the team needs to really adapt to such change and finally the roi i think that's uh, where it you know this, there there is a need to have that clarity in terms of what, how the uh, what kind of initial investments that the jni would expect and uh, just to help you get more securing the budgets and you know so in in terms of uh, if if we could clearly communicate in terms of what's the cost savings are expected what could be the increased productivity possibility and uh, maybe the tangible benefits of quality and other aspects as well uh, it can help justify the expenditure and you know you can just project how much of how much time is the payback time for this so i think that's essentially uh, where we see that major challenges in terms of adapting it Thank you. Thanks, Umesh. Uh, that's that's a comprehensive list here. So now time for a special giveaway only to attendees. Anuj, go ahead. Sure, Rika. So uh, we had announced about a special giveaway and, uh, you know, uh, the giveaway is that we, we would be happy to give you a detailed demo of uh, generative AI-based content development process, which is designed by Harbinger. And Umesh is, uh, you know, one of the leaders in that team. So uh, reach out to us, uh, write to us uh, on the email address uh, uh, that you see on the screen, and we would be happy to set up this demo session. And, uh, you know, and I've seen this, I work here. So, you know, it would be a fantastic uh, experience for you. So, yeah. And... Uh... 30 seconds to talk about Harbinger. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, to our audience, I'm happy to inform that, you know, Harbinger as a company, uh, we have been a trusted e-learning consulting and development partner for over 30 years uh, since our inception in 1990. And during this time, we have worked closely with uh, Fortune 500 companies and enterprise clients, and we have assisted chief learning officers and L&D leaders in aligning their business goals with learning and development initiatives. Uh, and as we all know today, the future of work, future of learning and future of automation is here. And uh, Harbinger's long experience in e-learning consulting and executing e-learning projects has allowed us to come up with robust uh, you know, e-learning frameworks, uh, you know, for example, the AI-based frameworks that Umesh uh, talked about. Um, and uh, talking about Harbinger as a group company, uh, we are 850 plus professionals uh, and we have offices and development centers in the United States and in India. Uh, and Harbinger has consistently demonstrated a track record in assisting our clients in closing the skills gap within their organization uh, also fostering organizational growth, uh, enhancing employee engagement, uh, elevating job satisfaction, and also for companies uh, applicable, also, you know, kind of uh, getting the right ROI from your extended enterprise. So that's at a high level about Harbinger. We'll wait to receive your uh, email from, on the contact email ID of Harbinger. And uh, we, would, we look forward to talking more about these things to you and showcasing our framework. And uh, uh, we also will have the LinkedIn profile links of our panelists uh, in the chat window right now. You're welcome to connect with them uh, over LinkedIn as well. Back to the key takeaways, I think, uh, you know, definitely there is uh, room for generative AI to potentially transform um, the content delivery process. And uh, clearly that has implications from a change management perspective. Uh, everybody's job is gonna change a little bit because of generative AI. Um, modernizing existing content seems to be one of the use cases. And, but really it can help in all stages of content development, right from outline all the way up to translations in multiple languages uh, with a special focus on prompt engineering. So I'm gonna um, suggest that we give a last word to uh, to you and Preston before we sign off today. There are a couple of questions in the Q&A panel. They can take a look or, uh, or simply um, share what's on their minds. Sure. Uh, as we look at the last question, will AI kill the natural inherent artistic talent of human be human beings? I think is what they were saying here. Yeah. 
I, I don't think that's the case. I, I think about um, the creativity that this in, in, in empowers us with. I think about the entire total concept of like creating something new. I think that that takes the artistic roots. And I, I would bring this back to something Omesh said about the skill set that it takes for prompting. Um, you know, that in itself is going to be an artistic event. That is going to be, you know, a relationship that you have with your generative AI uh, product. And I think that the talent and the um, artistic ability to express yourself, create the prompt you want, come to the image. I mean, when you ask Dolly for an image, there is definitely an artistic choice to be made there. So that choice is going to happen the whole way through this process and through the entire learning journey. Um, and, and that's just, you know, that's my opinion. I think that this empowers people that may not be as uh, fast or diligent in tools like Adobe Creative Cloud. I think that this is going to allow us to do things that we've not, you know, seen before, which is really exciting. Indeed. My response, just very quickly, is that particularly since the person who developed a lot of our courses is online, um, no, I mean, one of her key skills is, is, is writing script for, for the audio. And while it could be generated through AI, I know there's no doubt about that, I think she has that artistic and that human talent to develop what the AI avatar is saying. You know what I mean, if you follow me. Uh, that I don't, and maybe it can be replaced at some point in time, but I don't think that I would want to incorporate into my course, a new course we might develop, say just a script that was generated by AI without her having take a look at it at least. <laughs> And Sam, Sam asked a question about the learner perspective and uh, tailoring the journey based on individual knowledge and confidence levels. Uh, I feel like that could be an entire power hour of itself. There are so many uh, questions and feedback and so many things that I'd want to touch on there. Um, but Sam, I think you have a, a great perspective that, you know, from the dawn of time of digital learning, it has been, can I test out of this course? I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that at how many companies. And I think Sam's touching on this. And I think that instead of just testing out, how do we, you know, figure out where you are as a learner with the level of knowledge that you have and how do we create more value for you in that process and time that you've been scheduled? So again, I could, I could spend a lot of time answering Sam's question. And I think he, he, he or she offers a valid question in, uh, in the individual tailoring of knowledge, confidence levels, and generative AI learning journeys. Thank you. Fascinating discussion. Uh, over to you, Anuj. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vikas. Thanks to the panelists and thanks to the wonderful audience. Uh, we are just past time. So uh, for the unanswered questions, uh, we will be sharing the answers via email to you from the panelists. And we will also be providing you with the recording for today's session. And please don't forget to write to us uh, at contact at harbingergroup.com. Uh, and we look forward to you know talking to you further. Have a good day, good evening, and uh, see you soon from all of us here. Hey, thanks, everybody.